to this. The staff the events coordinator here at Schuler Books, and we are so glad that you are here tonight to celebrate with our author on the release of this new mm -hmm. book that we're so excited about. Um, I wanted to let you know that we do have books available for purchase right outside this room, and we just ask that you purchase the book at the registers in the center of the store before you get it signed tonight. Um, but both of our authors will be available for signings after the mm -hmm. event. Um, I think that's all my announcements, and I'm going to hand it over to the people you actually came to hear from. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have come not to see me. I didn't even know why my book was here, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, we we've come to see uh, Delia Fernandez Jones, mm -hmm. and I, full disclosure, I have known uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Fernandez Jones, since she was in kindergarten. <laughs> yes. Yes. We go back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and and um, my daughter isn't here. I think she's coming to one of the other ones. But they were at St. Andrew's School uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, I'm feeling really old. <laughs> yeah. My name is Randall Jelks. Uh, I teach at the University of Kansas. Now you ask me why I'm in Grand Rapids. Uh, I live in Grand Rapids. I have a large carbon footprint and I fly back and forth mm -hmm. and do all kinds of crazy things. But one of the, when Adelia told me she wanted to be a historian, uh, I didn't know whether to leap for joy or cry, <laughs> <laughs> but I was so excited because uh, the first book that I wrote was about Grand Rapids and it was called African Americans in the Furniture City and my hope was with that book was that other people would come and build upon that because there are multiple histories in the city and there's not one history and uh, when I uh, began I worked for the Grand Rapids Public Library and the all the old histories were about no offense but white guys who were business people mm -hmm. and they were the builders of the city well that wasn't quite the case um, you know, most guys don't do anything without women, and women who also build. The, and there were multiple stories. And so for Delia, who grew up here in this uh, wonderful, uh, to write this wonderful book, and I think it's a great book, and I'm wishing you Thank all you. success about it, it, is to tell a different story. Uh, um, and, and I've been following it, tracking it, and. Uh, even when it was in dissertation <laughs> yes. form uh, and, and, and trying to be an encourager. And I uh, just ha have a conversation about things I learned. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I'm, you know, I'm think, I always think I'm the smartest, I'm a dude, <laughs> I think I'm the smartest person in the room, That's right? they do. Uh, but this is just a, a wonderful thing. So, Delia, wh you could have written about another city. Why did you yes. choose home? So, it was, um, I think, an, an easy decision for me to think about Grand Rapids uh, for this type of project because I knew something that I think a lot of people in the broader field of historical studies, right, historians, other scholars, people, um, everyday people outside of the Midwest, it's something that they didn't know. Um, this was, I knew that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans had existed together in Grand Rapids for as long as my family was here, for example. Um, when I started to do the research, when I started graduate school, you know, we have to pick a topic, we have to write about something. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was read more about other, uh, other communities that I was sure existed, other Mexican and Puerto Rican communities. And in the literature, you know, all the books that were written on this, all the studies that were done, we only, I only found studies on Mexicans in the Southwest and Puerto Ricans in the Northeast. And the stuff on the Midwest was kind of hit or miss with uh, Mexican and Puerto Rican communities. So I knew they were there because of my own personal history, because I'm Mexican and Puerto Rican, I'm Mexican. Uh, my uh, great aunt and uncle were a Mexican couple in the 1950s, and their family's here to support me too today which is really exciting, but I knew for as long as we were here, there had always been these communities. And so I was thinking a lot about, uh, you know, what does it look like if we include these communities in our histories, how does that change a lot, of, a lot of the narratives that we've been presented with? 
So what, why, if we were to include Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in the history of Grand Rapids, how does that shift what we think about of Grand Rapids, right? So I've always, and for a while I was a little nervous about writing about Grand Rapids because I didn't, at first I was like, who's gonna care about Grand Rapids? Like I do because I'm from there, but who might else care about us? But it was yeah, after conversations with you and with other mentors, and writing, working on this project, seeing actually we have a lot to show the rest of the country. We have a lot to show other Latino communities or to, you know, there's a lot of lessons that can be drawn um, for Grand Rapids. So, so what was the, for the audience, what was the most disturbing thing you discovered about when you were writing this? Because oh. as historians, we yeah. discover horrible things all yeah, the time. Yeah. And we, we go into other people's business. That's what historians yes. do. We get the last word on all of y'all. Yes, yes. <laughs> Whatever you leave behind, we're right there snooping. Uh, I think the thing that was most disturbing for me was the ways that kind of racism and discrimination were just so entrenched. They were just everywhere. They were ever present. Um, and sometimes they are ever present still, um, but it was just alarming to see the ways that people were responding to Puerto Ricans and Mexicans when they were trying to find housing or find jobs or find schools for their children. Um, but so it was on this like everyday level, but then also there was a lot of resistance from the city. And that was really, I think that was really powerful in terms of uh, the experiences that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans had and then other Latinos have come to have in Grand Rapids. So, so, that, so you mean by the, the city government? The city government, the yeah. city government and just yeah. how late we were to get everything. Like we we didn't have translators in our municipal offices up in, in the until like the late 1970s. And that was because Mexicans and Puerto Ricans lobbied for it. They argued for it over and over and over again. And until then, I think the thing that was really shocking was that like they did everything themselves. They were serving as translators for one another. And I know that's sometimes hard for people to um, wrap their head around because many people will think, you know, why, why can't they just speak English? Why don't they just speak English? English. They're in Grand Rapids. Why don't they do that? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that they're citizens of Grand Rapids like anybody else. And they deserve access to those municipal services just like anybody else. And it's up to the city to provide those. Uh, and it was it was not until it, uh, these communities had rallied and put so much pressure that the city did start to say, like, oh, we are actually not serving a whole swath of our population. So one of the things I, that I loved about this book is the way you talk about placemaking, the way you describe yeah. uh, building homes and families and, and, and people I actually, some of them I actually know. And, and it was, uh, can, can you talk about that? Because that's a wonderful uh, dimension to, uh, to this book is about, okay, this is, for no better word, you can bleep me, uh, GRTV. This is a <laughs> shitty place. Uh, this is a hard place. But we're going to create home and community and the ways that people did that. And particularly, this, this is uh, women who are both working mm -hmm. and who are also creating spaces for to live. Yeah. Uh, place making was a, a really cool concept that that really fit and it was something that I didn't have the words or I didn't know there was a name for that and so just in case except like I didn't know there was a name for that up until a couple years uh, prior but it's this idea that you make a space for yourself and wherever you're at right so this is something that sometimes like urban planners will use when they think about planning for a city and what type of places we put in cities parks where they are how people use them but historians and latino studies scholars and black studies scholars as well have begun to use place making as like how we make both literal spaces for ourselves but then also these more like emotional these more um these uh intellectual places for ourselves within a space and so for me that made it really clear like once i heard that concept i'm like oh this is what they're doing this is what latinos have always done 
and that uh, Grand Rapids hasn't been welcoming to them. Uh, but there are jobs here and there's a reason, right, that people are here. There's job recruitment, there's displacement, there's all of these things that we know that happens. Uh, but what keeps people in this area is placemaking. It's how you transform a neighborhood that might not have been welcoming to you into a place where you know your neighbors. It's where you are raising your kids together. It's where you have, you know, you don't ac actually have a large enough community to have maybe dances or things like that, but it's making a dance, in, making dances and parties in your home and inviting people, inviting the other people in the community. That's how we make this place livable. That's how we make, where we go from like, we're, uh, you know, just surviving to thriving, to be able to live full lives here. The, the, and a part of this placemaking, because where, how, how I met you as a, mm -hmm. when you were young and I was old, <laughs> uh, was through St. Andrews, yes. St. Andrews schools. And um, St. Andrews was, mm -hmm. it's too bad, it's, it's very, too bad it's closed because mm -hmm. it was a great, wonderful school. And, and uh, Delia, my daughter, my son, all were at St. Andrews. I know you Calvinists out there think Christian <laughs> is good, but you need a nun to run a school. <laughs> <laughs> and Sister Marie Michael she ran that took no, no prisoners. Uh, she ran that and so, so uh, what's the, the, the kind of ways that you describe uh, churches, yeah. uh, particularly Catholic, uh, 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 the function of the parish. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think this is uh, for many of the Latinos who came in the 19, uh, like 20s to 40s and then into the, that's kind of one wave I describe, and then 40s to 60s, the church, the Catholic church was a very um, welcoming place. It was a place that they were familiar with. Um, so I guess, I don't know if I'm gonna say welcoming, but at least familiar. And I think that- Because yeah, it was very ethnic. It was, it was very ethnic based. Uh, they were starting to turn away from that by the time that Latinos really got uh, established in Grand Rapids, but there were some really dedicated community members who had started the Mexican Apostolate, which was just kind of a branch of the diocese that would reach out to uh, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, though they never changed the name until way, way in, uh, into the 70s, they changed it to the Hispanic um, apostolate. But they were ministering, or the Latinos who were involved were using the Mexican apostolate to minister uh, to Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, to create space within the church. And sometimes they created actual physical spaces. Like, uh, there was, you know, there were a lot of ethnic churches at the time. Mexicans and Puerto Ricans wanted one of their own as well. And so they, at times, were in different houses um, in that kind of uh, St. Andrew's area in the Sheldon Street area, different houses that were just across the street from the church at the time. Uh, those were places that people had mass at in the beginning. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting way to see how Mexicans and Puerto Ricans were starting to um, see themselves as one community because as I think what we know is that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans and other uh, Latino, Latina ethnic groups are not, all very, are not all similar, right? Every single ethnic group has their own history and culture and relationship with the United States that makes their experience different in the United States. And so it, it seemed like on the surface that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans could come and just automatically see themselves as one group. But there was a time that, that had, they had to kind of work that out. And the church, um, the uh, Catholic church was one of those places, right? So that they figured out, okay, how do we celebrate um, everybody's religious Latino traditions or religious Puerto Rican or religious Mexican traditions all together. How do we make sure that Puerto Ricans who were the smaller group were not left out and there was some wonderful leaders in the community who made sure that they weren't left out of there. And there were uh, something I, I talk about just kind of in passing in there because it, it was uh, a part of this larger community but not as much was uh, the presence of Protestant, Latino um, Protestant faith communities that were also very, uh, very, very small. Um, like 10, 12, 15 people. House churches. House churches mm -hmm. at the time. House churches at the time. But even those were Mexican. Mm -hmm. Even those were Mexican Puerto Rican places yeah. as well. And so uh, this is, it's one of the vehicles that brings people together, um, as well as housing, as well as working in the same jobs and, and those other social aspects. Yeah, I want, uh, having lived in Chicago where you had mm -hmm. distinct Puerto Rican neighborhoods, Humboldt Park, uh, to the north side of Chicago, 
uh, when I was there, Pilsen, mm -hmm. uh, which had been a Czech neighborhood mm -hmm. named after Pilsen. That's where your Pilsner beer comes from, mm -hmm. Pilsen. It, it, and then all of a sudden becoming, I think your dissertation advisor wrote about yes, yep. Pilsen, right? It, mm -hmm. So the, the, to see this neighborhood, but they were, they were distinct communities. Yes. That's what struck me. Like, there are distinct Humble Park, Pilsen. They were even distinct mm -hmm. street gangs. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah, very different neighborhoods. Right. Right. But it's not something that we saw in Grand Rapids. And so that was, uh, you know, there was my advisor wrote a book, Brown in the Windy City, uh, mm -hmm. Latinos and Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in Chicago. Wonderfully, wonderfully done book. Uh, but, you know, the question that people would ask, like, well, you know, isn't this just like Chicago? Like, it's. On its surface, maybe there's some overlap, but it's not because Grand Rapids, I mean, surely because of its size. And that also makes Grand Rapids yeah. interesting, right, yeah. to write about, is that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans couldn't live away from each other in separate neighborhoods. Uh, they couldn't, they, they're, they're, we just don't have the space. We don't have the space. That's not what the kind of um, social economics parts of this uh, dynamics of the city led to. They were in the same working class jobs. They were very much seen as one group before they started to see themselves as one group. And so they were sharing neighborhoods with each other, with black folks, with European immigrant families um, in the 1930s and 40s. It was much more, um, just much more mixed. And one of the things that's been, that was difficult actually is that uh, Latinos are very hard to find on the census because of the racial complexity of Latinos, because at some point they're, I mean, individually they all have a range of, of racial identities. But then the United States has labeled some uh, Latinos as white, some as non-white. It depends on the year. It's just really, uh, there's no comprehensive way to look at them. Um, so I was doing like street by street analysis and that's where I was seeing like how mixed this really was. I was wondering about the, the Mexican population. Was there a particular, uh, we think of Mexico as this one, yes, one yeah. place. Um, and Mexico is a series of states, but also different um, indigenous people, mm -hmm. language, language variation. Um, um, having grown up in New Orleans, I always relate to Veracruz, mm -hmm. right? Because that's mm -hmm. a Gulf Coast and we eat the same kind mm -hmm. of stuff. and. But then you go into the middle of Mexico, it's totally different. Yeah. Uh, so the Mexican population, the initial, is there a particular region that they, they arrive from? I always like to tell people Texas. <laughs> like, that's the region. Texas. But yes, right it, like Tejanos make up the majority of our Mexican community <laughs> yeah. here. That's like, that's just the, <laughs> the gist of it. But before they were Tejanos, uh, many folks were coming from kind of central Mexico, from Zacatecas. Uh -huh. And this is something that is, um, that we see all across the Midwest. And it's very much depicted by the rail lines. We just had railroads that connected central Mexico up to the border. And then from the border, you could get into San Antonio, from San Antonio to Kansas City, Kansas City to Chicago. And then from there, you can go anywhere in the Midwest. And so a lot of the uh, Mexican nationals that we, uh, that we received were from kind of the central um, Zacatecas region there. Uh, but then the, really the majority are folks who are coming from small towns outside of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the majority, especially during the, like, the 1920s to 40s. After that, we, it really becomes tough. much and, more diverse and, to track. And, 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 of course, that's Jim Crow. Yes. Jim Crow applies to Mexicans yes. and Texas folks. I mean, yes. if you don't know, those laws uh, apply to all through uh, Texas um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I think you do wonderfully in this book is to, to connect all of the, the different ways that people come up yes. laboring uh, and, and the kind of imperial forces that are, are always in the back. Folks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something that, that was hard to do because it's such a complex narrative. But in the first chapter, I talk a lot about how imperialism, ra uh, racism, and uh, displacement all kind of are three big factors that move Mexicans and uh, Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans all into the Midwest. And it's, uh, it's a complex story, but I think the, the gist of it is, is that U.S. imperialism was making it very difficult for Puerto Ricans to stay on the islands then and now. 
and it was also making it very difficult for um, everyday Mexicans, for farming, working class Mexicans to stay in Mexico. And uh, the same things were happening in Texas uh, with land ownership. That was kind of uh, the changing of hands and land ownership after the Mexican-American War to set people up on this path of where self-determination was just very going to be very difficult. And one thing that I talk about in the book um, that I hadn't really realized the way that it, it factored into all of this was Jim Crow. Um, in particular, the phenomena of uh, Mexican-Americans and Mexicans uh, who were lynched in the South, who were lynched all throughout um, California, Texas, Arizona, uh, and the ways that racial violence was also motivating people to leave. And so there's a lot, I mean, obviously, Tejano State in Texas, there's a ton of people who do stay, uh, but there are some, the ones that we came, came to the Midwest and to Michigan were people who were looking to escape that particular kind of racial violence and displacement they were experiencing. Right. Uh, you spent a lot of time, um, and, and I, it was wonderful talking uh, about these wonderful women yes. uh, of, of, of this community because women, of course, don't get enough of uh, their due. Uh, and uh, uh, so why don't you tell, tell us uh, all about uh, oh, uh, man. your interviews, yes. your conversations. This was a yeah, highlight. Right. This was a highlight of the book. I think. Uh, you know, it just it just so happened that a lot of the people that I interviewed were women. And part of this is because of the harsh realities that many Latino men don't make it into their 60s for the myriad of reasons that we just discussed, right? For racism, for labor, for all of these things. And so there was a lot of women who were uh, left to tell the stories. And that, I think, was, I, I think that's a really... I mean, it's, it's a really emotional thing, right? It's a really emotional thing. Um, the other thing that I found when I was talking to some women um, who were in their 80s and 90s when I was doing these interviews or who are now in their 80s and 90s is that when I would ask or when other people were to ask, because I even accessed other people's interviews with some of these women about their achievements and about what they did, women were often very quick to say, I didn't do much. That was my husband. My husband organized the dance. I just, I didn't do really, that was his thing. I just helped him. And it was, I li was listening to one recording with Guadalupe Vargas, who was one of the, uh, uh, part of one of the first families to come here, just was a, a, a wonderful family for opening up their home to migrants um, and immigrants coming in, um, was active in the church. And her daughter interjected and was like, no, mom, you did so much. You did so much. The cooking, the cleaning, the clothes, it's just the, the role that women played in placemaking, I mean, it's central. There's no placemaking without women. There's no way that we could have uh, established a community here without the hard work, work of women who were recreating culture in a place that was not hospitable to them and sometimes literally didn't have what they needed to recreate the culture. Like imagine, you know, trying to cook Puerto Rican dishes where you're like, you're on an island, that's where your food comes from, and now you're in the Midwest. Um, it was then when I started to realize, even in my own, like this, these conversations, I was like, yeah, we do put a lot of potatoes in our meals. <laughs> I'm like, why do we have so many potatoes? It's our, you know, if there's, there's things, ingredients that we're missing, and what do we have available to us? But it's also like the, it's the recreation of like dancing, of the folklore traditions, like who's teaching, who's teaching the dances? Who's making the costumes for the kids? Who is, uh, you know, making sure that this community is literally closed? It's the women who are doing it. Um, uh, Virginia Morales, it's uh, Guadalupe's daughter was recalling, she's like, she used to gather up about her mother that um, Guadalupe would gather up like every time somebody grew out of something, she'd take it and then it'd be in a pile waiting for the next migrant family who was coming into Grand Rapids to be able to clothe those kids with winter clothes, right? When people are coming off the migrant trail. So it's just, there's always been uh, women at the center of these things. And then when I start, I talk more a lot, a lot about activism uh, and just the, the relentless challenges that, that they, uh, this community faced. Women are the ones who are bringing this community together over and over and over again. In the 1970s, it becomes really tense because there, I mean, there's national 
nationalist social movements that are happening that could have threatened to divide this community because everybody was taking pride in their Chicano, Chicano movement. movement. They're taking pride in their ethnic identity, and that could force people apart, right? That if in instilling pride, and we saw it happen in some places, but we had people here who are working on these relationships and maintaining these relationships. And I do think it matters that this community was uh, already a Mexican, uh, Mexican community before the 1970s. So it makes it easier to do that. But there's women who are putting aside, where, whereas I've noted that there are some men who can't put aside their ego at this time, but women who are working quietly in the background to make sure that people know what opportunities are available to them, knowing uh, or just making sure that they have access and making sure that the progress continues in a, a certain way. So, I mean, women are, are, are absolutely key to the book. Chapter six, you spend a whole chapter on the mm -hmm. police. So, so policing in the city is not something new. Mm -mm. So tell us why do you, you d dedicated that chapter to yeah. the police. I mean, the sources were there. That's it. The sources were there. I didn't start off, uh, you know, when I started looking at this, uh, the research for this, I had no idea what I was going to find. I had no idea what the structure was. I knew some parts because they're my family stories. I knew about migration. I knew about placemaking. I knew about the Latin American Council because my family was there. I heard these stories as a kid. Uh, then I found the documents, right? Then I found the archival documents. But also, once I started looking through that, these other themes emerged and policing emerged as a major issue in Grand Rapids um, in the 60s, in the 70s. Of course, you'll recall the 1967 um, uprising here as, as in many other places. And that's kind of the entryway that I looked into this. And this was, I think, what, what was surprising is that, uh, you know, I talk a lot about um, African Amer the African American community and Latinos in the book. And this was one issue where there's been other issues that will split them apart, but this was one issue that people were able to get on the same page very quickly. And so what they were looking for, these two communities together were looking for a way to reduce pr police brutality. And that's, and there was, you know, number of complaints. I will tell you that the, a file, like I was hoping that I could find like a file of police brutality complaints mm -hmm. somewhere that they was just gonna be in one of these boxes or five of these boxes. Not there, mm -hmm. not there. But we hear them from other places, right? Yeah. You hear them from other places. Every once in a while, there'll be a case that gets so much attention, it'll end up in the newspaper. Or people will, after 1965, they'll start complaining to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, and I can find some there. And then oral histories. Oral histories tell us you know, what we need to know about those things. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, and then you follow that chapter about police justice for young people. Yes. You call it justice for kids. Yes. But, they're, they're adolescents there, uh, and 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 tell, because I, I I really all want you to read this book because yeah. I think one it's really crafted well, and you know, um, but tell us what, what's the justice for kids? Oh, I really that chapter was. Um, I really liked that chapter because it was something that was not in my dissertation and it involved a lot of another example of cross-racial cooperation and wonderful interviews. But so at the same time, right, we have this, we have a lot of issues for young people in Grand Rapids and for young people of color, for black and Latino students. They, uh, what we found is that the, they were doing the research themselves uh, and they found that there were, you know, there's a dropout rate of almost two thirds that uh, less than a third of Latino students in the 70s were graduating from high school. And that was, that's alarming, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, we have a lost generation in Grand Rapids of black and Latino students. And, of, and what I know well is the, the, this lost generation of Latino students. Um, so that was something that, we, uh, that there was a lot of documentation on for within the Latin American Council, the, that was a grassroots organization founded in the late 60s and um, was around to the late 70s. And they invested a lot of their um, funding into trying to figure, fix this, what was called the dropout problem. But what was very apparent was that this wasn't a dropout problem, but a push out problem. And that we had counselors and teachers who were just really apathetic to the plight of Latino students who were not interested in um, teaching them in a way that uh, they could understand. So uh, primarily, we had no bilingual education. We didn't have a, a comp 
a comprehensive bilingual education uh, program for K to 12 until maybe the 80s, 90s. We're really just getting there now. Uh, but in the 70s, there was no way if you spoke Spanish and you didn't, uh, you went to school, they would either put you back a couple of grades. And if you came, and that's if you were younger, if you came as a teenager, they're like, you just might as well not finish. You know, you might as well just go get a job because we have no way to teach you here. So parents, students, community members alike were calling for bilingual, bicultural uh, education via teachers, counselors, um, the curriculum itself, this is also a part of this larger social movements that we're asking for history to be told from the vantage point, not of rich old white guys, uh, but from women, uh, from people of color, from, uh, from poor people's perspectives. Uh, so they were there and asking for those things as well. Um, and what I, was, what I talk about uh, a lot in the book is the uh, Neighborhood Education Center, which was um, a program that was developed um, kind of at the state level with black administrators. We had a, the youngest black superintendent in the nation since and the first black superintendent mm -hmm. since Reconstruction. Right. Uh, that's over 100 years in, in Michigan, uh, who had developed a program to be kind of a, a catch all for uh, students who were pushed out of uh, pushed out of schools where uh, communities could run them. And this was a really innovative program because it doesn't at attract the type of negative resistance from mainstream white communities who were who if he tried to do this within the regular public schools would be told you're trying to take over our schools you're trying this is reverse discrimination and so he gave them to communities to run and the latino community here ran a really successful neighborhood education program that got students back into school graduated work experience and also um, what i find the most important was this like positive cultural identity development where they were able to uh, get kind of what was essentially what we call ethnic studies yeah. uh, at this uh, at this uh, uh, neighborhood education center. So kind of a way to save some of those in that lost generation. Yeah. And the, the, you end this book by talking about gentrification. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was I was that I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I see it coming down uh, yeah. Granville Avenue. Yes. I mean, but Granville Avenue uh, had always been a port of sort of a port of entry for Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. If you know the the near west side before the highway, we we many of us can't imagine Grand Rapids before 131, 131. comes. Tearing out people's houses and their their livelihood. Uh, there were churches. There were uh, the w some in the black community called the West Side, mm -hmm. where there were churches. There were all of the uh, residents. So the highway comes through uh, Granville Avenue. Had been uh, a port of entry for uh, uh, Dutch immigrants coming down. Uh, you know, there are waves of Dutch immigrants that, uh, as well. We often think. You know, uh, you know mm -hmm. that there are not ways, but they, these are people who are not always at the upper upper end of the economic spectrum, mm -hmm. but they're coming down Grand and Granville Avenue has served that that function. I want you to talk about this gentrification. Yeah, this was a hard chapter. Like this is the epilogue. You just want to be done with the book, and I was like, maybe I just like take each of these subtopics I talked about an update. Like this is what's going on now. It's an epilogue, and I just it just was so, reading so flat. It was so flat, and I had friends who were helping me talk through it, and they're like, you know, what is what is it? What are your real thoughts on this? And I'm like, this is so hard. Um, it was hard. Like I to write this chapter, the epilogue on. Uh, gentrification kind of came because of placemaking, right? So I spent like the whole book talking about placemaking, how we make places for ourselves, theoretically, physically, within a city, within a neighborhood, within the idea of belonging. How do we also make uh, like make other people recognize that we belong here too? And that's when it really also became more personal, right? All of this stuff in the past, like these are all documented. And I had to like these in the, the last chapter, the epilogue, I talk about places that I know, the places that I grew up with. Um, St. Joseph the Worker Church, Granville Avenue, like those are places that I, um, that my fondest memories are at. So they were, it was really hard to write about it. Um, but I, what I did was I tried to turn to uh, community activists. 
I just, I went with them because like, I can't, like I started crying every time I would write this. I'd go to write this epilogue and just cry just because it was, it's so, uh, it's so much, it's so immense. And so it was when I talked to Stephanie Rosales, who is the executive director of the Granville, Art, Granville Avenue Arts and Humanities Center and her work and the other folks with the Latino um, Community Coalition that I was able to kind of put a little distance for myself for the, 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 the things that I feel about it and just hear and listen to them about what it is that they see that's happening. Because I know I see something that's happening, but I'm also like, I don't live in Grand Rapids anymore. I haven't for a long time. So I have a, a certain uh, relationship with the nostalgia of the places, right? And so I wanted to ask them and I kind of let them kind of direct where that conversation went in terms of, you know, the complexities of gentrification in that, you know, there are more resources, there are more amenities in that area than there have ever been before, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. And if those amenities are coming like a train that we can't stop, then is there a way to shift the train into a, things that the community actually needs? Is there a way for um, people in the community to inform the changes that are coming um, so that they actually, you know, they actually meet what people need? And the thing that I'm like, the thing that, you know, the opposite right of placemaking is displacement. Right. And that's what is uh, one of the, the biggest worries, right? Is that there, we spent, you know, 70 years placemaking in that particular area for it all to start to feel like it's unraveling. Yeah, I, I wondered, uh, I have just two mm -hmm. more questions and we'll turn it to the audience. I, I did wonder, did you look at the, the stuff of the, uh, the, uh, the, the incoming uh, 1956 Highway Act and with 131, um, uh, uh, and I, I mean, all of the communities got yeah. this place, right? I mean, Polish, uh, communities along, you know, Michigan Avenue, uh, all of these communities get this, this place. Uh, uh, of course, it, it's significant because people do spend so much time mm -hmm. trying to make a community for which they know each other. You know, yeah, you and know. those are things that cannot be replaced. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's not uh, those networks, you don't fix them by adding a new grocery store or by adding a new bar, restaurant, right. or even sometimes, you know, it's these different type of placemaking that happens that allow people to survive. It's their connections. It's the people that they know who can babysit your kid when you have to take a shift or if there's an emergency. If you are short on something, they can help and you help each other. Those are the things that make people survive. And when displacement happens, yeah. those go with it. Yeah, I, I, the, lots of the 1967 ride of Detroit is about the highway mm -hmm. going through. It just tears all of the central fa fabric of the community uh, apart. The last thing I had to ask mm -hmm. you, because this is, it, this is striking to me, because uh, the Mexico has uh, uh, an Afro population. People yeah. don't realize this. And yeah. They don't talk about it. You know, Me uh, Mexico at one time were the mm -hmm. la largest slaveholders in this under Spain in North America, mm -hmm. and then it moves up, you know, I mean, um, to to the United States. But then Puerto Rico, you, you describe, you know, Afro-Puerto Ricans mm -hmm. um, um, as, uh, I, I was, cause, because I remember in Chicago, when I lived in Chicago, Black Americans and Puerto Ricans would look alike, mm -hmm. right? Except that you know, it's, it's either Martha or Marta, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it was, and but p then people had different, you know, well, you know, the Marenos are coming in my mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Here in Grand Rapids, you describe something totally different, and that was fascinating to me. I mean, I think the these racial politics play out, right? Mm -hmm. No matter where they're at. But one of the things that I tried to pay attention to is that there are racial differences among Latinos yeah. and that depicts their experiences. Okay. And so for many Afro Puerto Ricans, they had this very similar lived experience to black Americans in Grand Rapids. Yeah. They were denied housing with the same racial epithets that yeah. uh, black Americans were denied housing with. 
Uh, but then also they also felt really estranged from black Americans because sure, they couldn't talk true. to black Americans either. Right. Right. And different just feeling, culture. yeah, different cultures just feeling very lost and very isolated yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up that we have, uh, that there are Afro-Mexicans, but this is, all of this is hard to do because of the, the legacies of racism and colorism, right? This idea that we like rank ourselves within our communities by what we look like and the lighter we are, the better we are because that's, you know, akin to Europeanness, that you're closer to whiteness if you're lighter. Um, and so even with this, like Latinos are notorious for this, right? Even if they are clearly have some sort of African ancestry, they're like, I am not black. I am something else. And that comes from, no, no, no. right, this, this, uh, our, I grew up in New Orleans. You know what it is, right? It's our, our racial politics, politics right? right? Our racial politics that tell us that being close to blackness is bad in this country and being close to whiteness is good. So even when I interviewed people, sometimes they were like, what are you talking about? Like, I will, I interviewed somebody who was black and white from Grand Rapids, and I asked, and I said something like, and the people know you were black? And she was like, oh, honey, I'm just a little black. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, like, I mean, the whole, and I'll be honest, too, this was somebody that I thought was Puerto Rican my whole life. <laughs> so I'm like, I, you know, like, at this point, I'm like, what are we talking about, right? What are we even doing here at this point? But it's that, that, uh, it's not a, like, we have it everywhere, but we have it in a special kind of way here in Grand yeah. Rapids, right? That this woman who was biracial, black and white, knew to downplay that blackness yeah. in a particular way here. Sure. And had this, you know, was for too many people in our community thought she was Puerto Rican her, yeah. her whole life, right? And so uh, it made sense for her, like Puerto Rican was maybe a little bit more acceptable right. than black, right. right? In Grand Rapids. And so even if I, I know there are other Afro Latinos in this community, but if they don't identify as such, wh who am I to say, right. right? So I just comment on kind of the broader ideas that are behind, you know, that we do, that Latinos are a racially complex or heterogeneous mixed population the ways that we have racial politics are similar to the U.S., but they're different. And we have, you know, Latinos have their own uh, racial politics based on Latin America. Right. And then we also have the U.S. who places theirs above theirs. Yeah. And it essentially, um, uh, you know, equates to colorism. Yeah, you didn't mention anything about Spanish because I was yeah. like, you know, uh, Caribbean Spanish is like the endings get mm -hmm, le mm -hmm. left off. Uh, you know, people talk about it in the it, interviews. People will say, "He's like, oh, that's my best friend." Right. You know, we spoke Spanish. I didn't really understand his Spanish, it's or right. they talk so slow, or they talk it, so fast. Well, Caribbean is more yes. is, is uh, staccato, you know. Yeah. The, 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 uh, in, in Mexican, Mexican Spanish, a little, a little slower. Little yeah. Slang, language. yeah. I didn't talk a whole bunch about <laughs> it. It was uh, like because some one thing that happens is that the environment of Grand Rapids, where you just learn to live with the ending of the Spanish <laughs> being cut off, or you learn to listen to the the slower Spanish. You're like, yeah, this is all I got. So here we are. You know, those those differences become a little less important yeah. in the grander schemes, but in like the personal relationships, sometimes they come out in the interviews. <laughs> Okay. So, first of all, uh, I want to open this up to you if you have any questions. You need to read the book, and that's why you're here. Y'all go <laughs> buy the book. Yeah, yeah that's why you're Thank here. Thank you, Randall. Yes. Hi. I don't know if you remember me. You went to school together. Yes. But um, I was curious, uh, in your research, uh, if South High came up, and if that impacted any of the relations between uh, Black and Latin. Mm -hmm. of the two groups, mm -hmm. the three groups, yeah. the multiple groups, right? And then also, one last part, um, mm -hmm. since you looked into City Within a City, or did any uh, research with that book? Yeah. Okay, so South High plays a role in that some Latinos also went to South High as well. But they're kind of, uh, because the issue with South High becomes so polarized as black and white, Latinos kind of get lost in the middle there that they're just uh, like a small other, right? So when, the, when South High closes, that some Latinos move to Central High School and then that changes what Central looks like and being a place where more Latinos end up. But they're really, I mean, I have like oral history quotes from people who were like, I was just completely other. I was not black, I was not white, I was just completely like a non-factor and it was really isolating. And so I think for that, like I didn't find there were so few people also because so many Latinos aren't getting to high school. That's the other thing that makes it like, 
it, yeah, it starts like the numbers get lower and lower as you get higher and higher. And so it didn't become this major, um, a major factor in kind of what I wrote about, but I did, you know, I noticed some of the lived experiences of people there. And then, City within a city. Yes. Um, so both um, Dr. Jones's book, um, African Americans in the Furniture City, and City Within a City, were two books that I like poured over all the time. Where for me to be able to understand what Latinos experience, Latino experiences were in Grand Rapids, I had to understand the Black experience here because it is so dependent on the Black experience. Because in Grand Rapids, you're white or you're black, right? That's what it ended up being by about the uh, after World War II, right? When the mo when I see the largest Latino community up until that point, and so I needed to understand like where black folks were living, what was kind of their uh, political dynamics within the community, how they were engaging with the city to be able to understand how Latinos were, because many times they're pit against each other. And to me, the ways that they come together are, are the most fascinating ways. So I think I see most of that, like the camaraderie and things like that, um, in the 70s, when folks are, uh, are sharing more and more space with one another. So I mean, it starts as early as the 50s, 60s, but I hear more from oral histories and stuff into the 70s. And so one thing that I always, like one thing that I didn't put in the book, uh, but it's our family story, is like my family grew up off of Granville Avenue um, on Graham Street. And my, like all my dad's siblings are Puerto Rican. They all have Spanish names except the last three. And they were named after uh, the, the two boys, my dad and his brother, Alex and Johnny, were named after the black folks who lived behind him. And they, the, my uh, aunts and uncles grew up calling them Daddy Johnny and his wife was Mama Sally and Daddy Johnny's brother was Alex. And those were like the stories that we all knew that we went, they went to school together. They dated each other. Sometimes they married, sometimes they did it. Sometimes they fought with each other. Um, but most of it from what I learned in the seventies at least was like how just folks in a neighborhood, you know, friends in the neighborhood, you fight with them one day and the next day they're your friend again. Other, mm -hmm. other questions? Comments? What have you discussed? Yes? Yes. Hey, Andy. Thank you. Yes, that's yes. Yes. Neighbor, Vecina, your neighbor. Mm hmm. Yeah. Good neighbors. Yeah. So that's my aunt, my aunt Delia. I'm yeah. named after her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also my cousin Angie. So, <laughs> so as you're talking and, and I'm going, oh yeah, I can see that now because I find that in our family we have a lot. We have a large family. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to know that there's so many siblings and there's so many cousins and so many aunts and uncles and so many cousins and so many cousins. Mm -hmm. Or you go to the army or the military. Yes. Right? And so that's what we see. But nothing like you need to do this to get a better job. No. That was never an option. Yeah, so that's one of the things that led me to that that police the, the chapter on police brutality like takes some turns. But one of the things that we found was there like the hiring for getting into the police um, academy and all these things depend it depended on if you could go to college, if you went to college and what score you got on all of these tests. And like, we are systematically excluding so many of our, so many young people and the, there ends up being a, a lawsuit against the city. Um, but it's a black, uh, a black veteran and a uh, Mexican veteran who are on this joint lawsuit together. And it's, they didn't have any other choice. They would, both of them talk about like, well, I graduated, but then I didn't really have any job prospects, any good prospects. So then I signed up for Vietnam 
I'm like, who's signing up for Vietnam, right? Because well, Vietnam, I mean, they are, right? Because yeah. there's no other options, right? We're getting, we're, we're seeing like the, the devastation that Vietnam is doing to so many, but the community, but they're signing up because they don't have any other options. And there is a, a large uh, population in, that was uh, by raised by ethnicity that was affected by this. And it's, it's uh, so when we do have Latinos who went to college who are few and far between, right? That was something that was really special in the community. Uh, the, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there was still hardly any translators for families. Yeah. One was because uh, they were not educated enough to take those kinds of positions within an office. So my observation as an administrator was I saw children acting yeah, mm -hmm. as translators, yeah. which affected the, 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 the structure of the home mm -hmm. because the kids would go and they would miss school, and I would as say, Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was that kind of, we were fighting that issue even within the school to keep kids in school, which mm -hmm. affected their attendance, which you can't teach them if they're not there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it affects the dynamics in the family, like you said, where yeah. children have to act like adults. Exactly. It's, and that's all that mm -hmm. makes it really difficult. Yeah, I would say just for my own uh, research that uh, this has been a problem in Grand Rapids for people of all colors. Uh, that the, the kind of ways that the, the school gave disincentive uh, mm -hmm. uh, early, the, the first urban league study, the National Urban 1927, you just, you see the disincentive by the, the public education system. We don't, we think we treat everybody equally, but you, kids pick up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You don't think I'm smart, you don't think I'm bright, you know. Uh, there are all kinds of signals that are sent to children uh, the, that they like, oh yeah, well, I, I don't have a place here mm -hmm. for, for that. And that's here and early on. Yes, if Laverne. Hi. Um, I grew up in Grand Rapids and um, noticed that, and my dad's a janitor at all schools, yeah. at three schools, and so we saw a lot of this, and um, especially in going up to the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was coming of Spanish church in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and then a lot more Spanish speaking people to go in. Yep. And um, so I wonder now what do you think of them as a uh, site um, in that area for Southwest yeah. Middle School, Southwest High School, and the elementary school? Yeah. And it's almost a little. Uh, it's like a campus? Area. Yeah. Or Spanish speaking students. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's really complex, right? It it's uh, especially when I think of, you know, St. Joseph the Worker yeah. as an anchor in the community, right? Yeah. For And I talk a lot about that. I, I also have a chapter in another book on religion and, and power um, about St. Joseph as being this anchor, as being one of, you know, something that was very unique among churches, even across. Um, across the country where you had Mexicans and Puerto Ricans who made up their uh, one parish as early as that time. It's very, it's, it's not something that we've seen else in a lot of other places. Um, we see it later, much later, but in that particular time, we, we, it, was, it was very unique and it was such an anchor to the community. So one, the, um, you know, di thinking of disinvestment of the diocese to move the church to Wyoming is difficult. It was, di that's difficult to stomach. It's, it's, hard to think, you know, when we're thinking about where these large institutions, philanthropic, uh, uh, philanthropic institutions have resources where they're choosing to invest them. And it wasn't in Granville Avenue, right? It wasn't in that neighborhood, which is uh, incredibly unfortunate. But then to have this school that parents and families, you know, the school is supposed to embody bilingual, bicultural education. And that's what parents and families have wanted for 70 years, 70 years. So it's hard, you know, it, it's, I don't know if it's the double-edged sword, but it's just, 
these are the, the these complexities about gentrification and change that that really change uh that can change a neighborhood i think the one thing that uh was expressed that stephanie and other community organizers expressed is we hope that the families can stay in the neighborhood to keep sending their kids there because if the area keeps changing and we keep pricing out people how can we ensure that those kids can get the k-12 education it's very complex mm -hmm. down Yes, towards Wyoming, and Wyoming has changed, as we've seen. Yes, yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your comments and uh, for your observations as somebody who's there. That's true. And we say to everybody. Yes. Everybody says that. And everybody in their mayor usually is my family and the kids around us. Yeah. And uh, there's a Christian school, I think I mentioned in Columbia, where the, everybody has the whole field Yes, yes. <laughs> I do. Um, you know, the stories that I've heard, you know, the people where I'll hear stories from my parents or from other oral history participants. And I'm like, you know, I'm thinking of a more rigid racial segregation. Uh, so I'm like, is that person black? They're like, no, that person's white. I think he's Italian or that person was Polish. And then I'm like, oh, is that person Italian? He's like, no, that person's black. And I'm like, OK, you know, trying to follow, uh, which, you know, it's kind of a bizarre line of questioning for somebody who's talking about their friends, you know, they might not necessarily think in those terms. But as I was trying to track, like, who's living by who and how this neighborhood trying to recreate what the neighborhood looked like without all the adequate like top down data it's the conversations of you know who did you play with who was in your class those types of things yes that's in the, the other ways that we see right how communities shape are there any other questions that you you have this one one of the things that I, I feel proudest about, about this is that, and I've said to some people earlier, uh, cities, we, have a, we are having a big conversation in the United States about history, mm -hmm. right? And there are histories in every place. They're not, there's no one history, right? We all experience the United States differently, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that's a... So to have this as a, a, a in conversation as the, the multiple histories that we have and overlapping uh, histories uh, that we have, that's really important for us to remember. That's democratic. Mm -hmm. That really mm -hmm. is democratic. We may not like hearing what other people like myself or Delia have to write about, but that's also a part of our histories as well. Now, we don't do anything about the past, but we can do something mm -hmm. about our present, mm -hmm. uh, as we are aware of our present. So thank you for writing this history. Mm, thank you. And the last part of the future is we have new groups of people from Central America, yes. Guatemalans, Nicaraguans, yes. um, all. Yes. And, and they also are being come by US imperialism, the yep. war on drugs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so we need. How do, how, do, how do we think about these, these yeah. that, that future history? And who's going to write it? Who's going to write it is a really good question. Um, it's not me. It is not me. Uh, this, is a, this is a really, really important part of Grand Rapids' most recent history. Uh, I do, oh, it's, there's so much here. I do think that Grand Rapids continues to be a site where people come because of our long history of being a pan-Latino community or a community with more than one Latino ethnic group. We know what it is to figure it out amongst ourselves within the Latino ethnic group to make sure that folks are not overshadowed, that people have representation that's really important, how to work together. We've had this history, right? For better or for worse, sometimes it's worked out, sometimes it hasn't. But I think that the one of the reasons that people keep coming to Grand Rapids from those regions, obviously because of the imperialism and the same types of displacements and racism that we saw um, still holds, but it's also because of placemaking, because we have institutions, we have, uh, so I talk a little bit about in the end about, you know, the Latin America Council dissolves in 1978, but the Hispanic Center of West Michigan starts. Uh, 80, it's 80, 80 or 78, 80, 80 depends, yeah. Right. And then uh, other organizations start p coming because we, at one point, we had one organization to serve the whole community, which was, you know, very taxing on that organization. But now we have more. We have this, like, Latino placemaking is something that we know and we do well. Uh, but there is, there are the same questions that uh, arise with this community labor 
where are people working? The New York Times just put out that expose that exposed uh, her, si her side. Her side. Her side. Is that how you say yeah. it? The her, the place the where we have 15 year olds, we have teenagers working, working, so right? Lot, we know that, time. right? Our educators. Our, that was an educator. That was a teacher who blew the whistle on yeah. that, right? That we have students. And so uh, we have students doing this work. So all of these questions still arise, right? And so how are we as Grand, as Grand Rapids, as the Midwest, as West Michigan, how are we making this a place where those people continue to belong? And I can tell you that it is not, it is not hiring them at 15 for these wages as subcontractors, right? It comes with a lot more support. It comes with a lot more bigger questions that maybe we can't answer ourselves, but that we can be a part of this larger conversation about what is leading to 13, 14, and 15 year olds to be on this migrant circuit, to yeah. be coming here, to be uh, you know, ex uh, exploited in that way, their family members also exploited. So I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, and that there is a really rich history in that post-1980 uh, Grand Rapids that I would be very happy to, happy to help anyone, <laughs> anyone do, especially if you have a young history scholar out there, so history major in undergrad, wants to go to graduate school, doesn't want to, but still wants to write this book, just let me know and I will help in that way. I don't think it's, it's definitely not me, but it really needs to be done. Yeah. Well, let us give, first of all, give Adelia our thanks uh, and a uh, big round of applause. And you can go on. Thank you. I will say thank you to Randall. Biden's thank you book. to Elizabeth, Joe, uh, who's helping with the live stream there. And, uh, you know, Randall has always looked out for me. Always, I call him Uncle Randall at this point. <laughs> um, so he's, a, he's a mentor, but he's, you know, he's my academic uncle. He might as well be my regular uncle as well in the ways that he's looked out for me. And thank you to everybody who came. Um, obviously, you know, I have somebody from elementary school here, from college, my family. Uh, this is really amazing. So it feels good to be back. Thank you. You need to go sign books. Yeah, I want to go sign some books. <laughs>